from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Snowflake Summit 2024 was a week-long event that brought together more than 20,000 of Snowflake's core enterprise customers, developers, and ecosystem partners. The event highlighted really the expanding aspirations of Snowflake as it evolves its data cloud into an AI data cloud, that's the new terminology, and a platform for developing intelligent data apps. Snowflake Summit 2024 marks the next chapter in the company's history in our view, with new CEO Sridhar Ramaswamy taking center stage, really driving product innovation even faster, and having an ambitious TAM expansion strategy. Snowflake has moved beyond being you know, a nice, friendly, simpler, very powerful and scalable data warehouse to tackling new problems, including how to bring AI value to enterprise customers, helping ecosystem partners monetize and providing tools and services to build AI-powered enterprise data apps. Hello and welcome to this week's theCUBE Research Insights powered by ETR. We're here at Snowflake Summit. In this breaking analysis, George Gilbert and I are going to summarize the top takeaways from Snowflake Summit and we'll share our thoughts on the announcements, the innovations, the competitive implications, some of the challenges and opportunities Snowflake faces, and we'll share our expectations for next week's Databricks Data Plus AI Summit, which is actually taking place in the same location. We're here, George, at Moscone South. Back-to-back -back weeks on breaking analysis. Thanks so much for coming on. Good to be with you, Dave. Okay, so let's bring up the first uh, slide, if you would. We're going to ask the question, is Snowflake a data cloud? Are they an AI company? Or a data application platform? And of course, George, our answer is yes, they're all three. We're no longer talking about just databases, data warehouses, rather we're talking about data application platforms. You're building data apps, you're building apps with data, something John Furrier has talked about 10 years ago. Data is the new development kit, and you're infusing them with AI. The first point on this slide is the competitive landscape is changing. You got new competitors beyond cloud data warehouse. Um, you got Microsoft. They've got their single S, uh, SKU strategy that you're going to talk about. You got Salesforce with 150,000 customers with very strong low code tools that are autodidactic and can turn data into transactions. George, how is the competitive landscape changing? What did you learn? Over to you. So, when you raise that question, is a data cloud an AI company, data application platform? I mean, you're, to boil it down to terminology from Saturday Night Live from the 70s, where I might be dating myself, is it a dessert topping or is it a floor wax? <laughs> you know, and the answer is both. Because what started out as a platform for building analytic artifacts, whether it's dashboards originally on the Snowflake side or um, machine learning models on the Databricks side, increasingly our applications are driven by analytics. And the, the, the way you steer the analytics is with data. And then, so basically applications, we're, we're seeing an infusion of analytics throughout more and more of what were operational applications. So what started out as a data platform becomes an application platform. That's, that's the big transition. Big, big transition. Coney, if you'd bring back that slide again, that slide uh, number two, um, which is the first slide, sorry to, for all the confusion here. We're, we're real time here at Snowflake Summit. The vision that uh, Benoit Dajaville laid out um, and he's had this vision for a while, is to be the iPhone of data apps. And this is a real challenge. Um, you know, it's contrasting that, George, with Databricks' vision, which is really they're trying to push the whole separation of compute from data, allow to any data uh, uh, engine, essentially, to operate in the data. Uh, that's their, their kind of vision. But the iPhone for data apps is very powerful. Uh, a new breed of apps is potentially coming into the marketplace. Your thoughts? So let's, let's expand, start with that as the sort of center of the circle, which is iPhone, um, where Snowflake is the iPhone platform, and what, what Benoit, the technical founder, um, wants is that there's a um, 
like the App Store, a profusion of applications that turns this platform into you know, value domain for domain specific applications. But let me, let me back out for a second because it's relevant to what the how the competitive space is changing. Um, the, this simplicity that Benoit is trying to build, others are trying to architect a similar simplicity, but they're trying to corral more pieces. And so let me explain. So when you alluded to Microsoft trying to sort of sell all of Azure, all of Office, all of Dynamics as one big skew, kind of tied together by the power platform. They're then putting the Fabric, which is there finally, you know, after a decade, they have a competitive data platform. That's just a component, but they're selling this whole stack as a way to build applications. And their differentiation is in the comprehensiveness of the SKU, but also the simplicity of building applications with Power Platform. So that's their differentiation at the top. Before you go to, you're going to Salesforce now? Yeah. Yeah, but so before you do that, so that, that what does Microsoft have in that, that Snowflake has to build? Okay, when Snowflake talks about Streamlit and the data products part, which we're going to get into, they, they have a user interface and they have, um, they have a studio, they have a whole bunch of developer experiences and a notebook, um, but they don't have one overarching low-code development tool chain, which is, in, in Microsoft's case, Power BI, Power Apps, Power Automate, Power Pages, um, and then Copilot Studio. That's, that's where they have one low, low code, no code tool chain that goes across the entire product line. Okay, so they have a better data platform, data engine, or a compute engine. Um, uh, but Snowflake. They don't, Snowflake does, but they don't have those other tools that you just mentioned, so, so yeah. Fabric, which is Microsoft's uh, uh, compute engine data platform, is they're going to drag that along as a good enough kind of approach. Right. All right, what about Salesforce? Okay, so Salesforce pioneered SaaS. They now have 150,000 customers. Just about anyone who's doing customer management other than Hub, HubSpot customers is using Salesforce from the very biggest companies to, to very small companies. Um, and you know, whether it's um, for, for outbound sales, for inbound with call center, for field service, but all those all those customers needed some place to bring their customer data together to do analytics. It used to be Snowflake, and to some extent Databricks. Now they built a data platform and low-code tools, and they put a, a customer data model, a customer 360 data model in there, so all the code that used to be in the province of data engineering in Snowflake is now sort of just configuration driven, point and click, no code, low code, and what's also crucial about theirs is when something happens with a customer, like moving a lead through a funnel, or reacting to an ad, or converting in an e-commerce storefront, that can automatically update the analytic models. In other words, their analytics get smarter because they're integrated with the operational apps. Got it, they've, they've, and they've got that, that application logic and everything is yeah. harmonized. Okay, let's bring up that same slide. Again, the third point we want to make is the the issue, and we're still squinting through this, is just rationalizing Snowflake's margin model while competing with software-only data en engineering off offerings. What we're talking about here is, last year at Snowflake Summit, we started to get inklings of customers were doing some of the, the data pipeline work, the data science, data engineering work outside of Snowflake to reduce the, the cost of the compute engine. Um, at the same time, Snowflake has this integrated model where they can do streaming, they can do advanced analytics, they can do data engineering, they can now do Gen AI, um, they can do all these things inside the platform and it's, and it's beautifully integrated. Um, you know, this is an interesting one, George. Um, coming back to you, we've talked to some customers who have said, yes, right, but, but we know that Databricks, for example, doesn't include AWS costs in its, uh, in its, in its pricing. Snowflake does, and so that somewhat skews the data. Um, We've never seen the analysis, although Snowflake shared with me that they have internal analysis. Love to see that and love to see it published. Maybe we need to do the work, but what have you learned this week about that issue of you know, rationalizing the margin model, meaning they've got to price it to the point where Mike Scarpelli can go to the street and say, hey, we've got 77% you know, gross margin, right. you know, versus maintaining market share. 
So, so this, is, this is the hard part where it's difficult to tease out the suspicion that, they, that there are some workloads that are very price sensitive, like data engineering, which is roughly a third of Snowflake workloads. This is where you're just bringing in the raw data, you're transforming it, you're making it normalized, and then you might even turn it into you know, final data products like dashboards, models, all the pipeline work, mm -hmm. as opposed to doing the um, slicing and dicing or doing the, 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 the data science. The reason we heard there was pushback you know, last year, it's in the Snowflake business model, as you, as you were saying, they are, they've, they're selling the whole stack, including the hardware. Most other competitors, including Databricks, are just selling software, and Starburst as well. So um, you could say, well, someone's going to have to buy the hardware you know, even if they're buying, if they're buying the software from a competitor, they're buying the hardware from AWS or Azure. So, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. As you alluded to, the 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 issue is, um, if they are presenting to Wall Street a software company business model with 70% product gross margins, they may be marking up the hardware to such a level that the overall cost of the workload is higher than if you bought the product separately. But if the overall experience is uh, more rich and, and, and customer friendly, it may have residual benefits that ultimately you know, win the day. All right, let's bring up that, Coney, that same slide again. Last point we want to make here is that Snowflake is really finally surfacing the power of many years of all this underlying plumbing work and we're seeing it with the data catalog, Snowflake Polaris which is open source, um, you know, Horizon, uh, which is not, but it's the you know, heavy governance piece. Um, Iceberg as an opportunity to expand its, its present, uh, presence in the marketplace. Um, but, but that underlying plumbing, George, Coney, if you bring up the next slide, is sort of shown here. This is sort of an eye, eye test, but this is how it all works together. You've got the multi-cloud layer, um, Snowflake was one of the first to, to develop the multi-cloud uh, strategy. We, we called it super cloud um, with a single global namespace, uh, e even though most people are running in, in individual clouds. Um, nonetheless, it works well on multiple clouds and it looks, it's the, pretty much the same experience. They've got multiple data, data types. You bring streaming in, you got one place to develop, deploy and operate. They've got, and you can see here in the next layer, they, they ingest, they transform, they can incrementally update. They, they can do sophisticated analytics. It shows time series here and much more. Then they go to machine learning. It takes raw data in, it turns it into metrics. Like what are engagements like? What's the, the clicks and, and so forth? And that all, all of this sort of updates automatically with you know, compressed time frames and granularity. Now they're adding Gen AI, big focus on Gen AI at this event with Cortex, with Cortex serverless and fine tuning. Uh, they're bringing in the NVIDIA capabilities. Uh, which we'll talk about a little bit. They think we've had Nemo. Now they're bringing in NIMS, the, the API capabilities. And they make that all presentable and, 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 and governed. Um, and on top of that, Snowflake is building a, a, a marketplace uh, with partners and a marketplace for data. And they've got the developer and operational tooling above that, which is integrated. And then of course, AI on top of that to make things easier for end users. So, Coming to you, George, and you can ask Coney to bring up the slide where it's relevant, but take us through this stack. Okay, before we get to the slide, let, let, let me just emphasize that these announcements that we've been hearing about 12, 24 months, they are all now GA or near GA, so public preview. Let me, let, let me tick some off. Snow Park Container Services, which is really critical because that allowed anyone to bring any compute into the Snowflake context. Which was announced last year at yeah. the show. Yeah, but it's, that was uh, their big announcement yes. last year. Now it's coming to market. Yes, yeah. and so now that, that, that allowed you to, to integrate any engine or any tool so they can access Snowflake data within the security context and the customer's um, governance. Um, that's, that's how they dealt with open data, by going through their engine. Um, then the um, open data, Iceberg Tables with the Polaris catalog. So now you can read and write Iceberg Tables with an open catalog, um, and, and we'll get into that. Cortex, um, Gen AI uh, will expand. Horizon, a business and operational catalog for native Snowflake data, a native notebook experience for da data scientists, 
um, and then the AI experiences. But now let me tie together. So, Kony, go back now to the, that eye chart, that, that architecture slide. Um, let me give you a scenario why, why Snowflake has the power and simplicity together. So, um, take a live e-commerce personalization um, scenario where you're streaming in data from the e-commerce app while the user is at the app and you want to be able to react in real time to what the user is doing to further personalize the experience. That's, you know, that's sort of the holy grail, but to do it all in one package. So um, you have the live session data coming in, you update the user's experience, and, and it's in one platform where you can develop, deploy, and operate it all you know, with simplicity. So with competition, that would be multiple different products, security models potentially, different data stores and pipelines between them, and then much more complex to develop, deploy, and operate, and you'd lose all that latency in, in, in reactivity. So, so let me just take through some of the, the capabilities. You're saying you'd lose that low latency. You would yeah, lose yeah. that low, yeah. Um, so for ingestion here, you have like Snowpipe uh, streaming, where you come in with very low latency, and then dynamic tables where this is the, their, their, this beautiful capability where it's essentially materialized views that each can chain together the tr all the transformations that used to be done in DBT. You can still define them in DBT, but whereas in an, when, when they were done externally, you would have to refresh every table, and so it's a very long batch process, or even if you're trying to make it less than batch, you know, you're, you're, you're making the sausage every, you know, every link. Mm -hmm. um, so here you're just, you're adding the little bits. <laughs> Good analogy. <laughs> um, so now um, you can work with both the incoming session data from the e-commerce stream, but also um, the historical contextual data about what did the uh, customer purchase in the past and other things. So you get the full picture. That they didn't have in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can set the latency for refresh, so the whole pipeline, at, from the very, at the very end of the pipeline, you say, um, right now it's a minute, um, very soon it'll be down to 10 seconds. This is you know, close to you know, real time. Close to real yeah. time. And then Snowflake automatically and incrementally updates that whole thing. Um, and then that, that can feed into the machine learning, um, uh, the, the machine learning models themselves which generates a, a new screen of products to you know, select from. Um, anyway, then outside that scenario, because I couldn't come up with an intergalactic scenario, um, <laughs> the, the, the Gen AI, this is you know, what their big uh, emphasis was. That's all what Benoit calls data flow programming, where the database engine is processing data. But now you add Gen AI to work on the data, um, so they have, uh, developer functions, Cortex, so serverlessly you can call out things for like text summarization, sentiment analysis, translation, text generation, but then they added with the partnership with NVIDIA, um, the NVIDIA inference microservices, which are really advanced, where you've got all sorts of chatbots, um, image and video creation, digital assistance, code gen, uh, drug discovery, avatar creation, okay, and um, then, and the one other thing that I want to dwell on, just this is important, because it ties into the semantic layer. This is like Cortex Analyst and um, Cortex Search. Cortex Analyst is let me talk to my data in natural language. So right now, you have to write a text file that explains a, an administrator or developer that says this table means this, this table means that, these columns mean this. That's, that's kind of crufty for now. And so right now, someone in building a co-pilot into Power BI would actually have um, a richer ability to query data because their semantic layer is, is better defined. But what, what they're doing, what, we, what they didn't announce and what we learned offline is that over time they're going to add an editor to define like metrics and dimensions. They're going to start learning the meaning of some of the queries from the natural language queries that the user brings in. They will add to the optimizer um, something that does the OLAP, the, w the slice and dice that's different from the, the internal engine. Um, in other words, all those metric um, semantic layers for BI tools that we've heard about, that's going to get collapsed into this engine over time. And then, of course, they'll allow those tools to author 
these metrics. Anyway, the point is, we're seeing the emergence of a semantic layer. It'll take a little time. When it happens, then the natural language will be very, very powerful. Really powerful. And so you're seeing now the, the what, we, what we mean by that plumbing, taking advantage of that. They've, they've, Snowflake has built this out over years and it's very well thought out uh, architecturally and you know, they're doubling down um, and, and adding in incremental value. Now one of the areas, the other areas that they're doubling down on is with NVIDIA. Everybody wants to have Jensen at their conference. So, Coney, if you bring up the next slide with, with Jensen's picture, he was zooming in from Taiwan where he was at Computex. Uh, he announced, they announced a, a yet another chip. They're on that one year cadence. Uh, but at any rate, Sridhar had him in here uh, at, in the keynote. We called it Finding Nemo. Um, Nemo's the Gen AI model development piece which they containerized, they announced they were going to containerize last year and NIMS, their, their, which are their APIs, to extend and essentially turbocharges Cortex. George is going to explain that. And it's all delivered. It's, it's made available through Snowpark Container Services. That was the announcement that they made last year. That starts to set up this really rich developer platform that can take advantage of all this so-called plumbing that we've been talking about and you know, one of the world's best compute engines. So George, take us through the importance of the NVIDIA relationship and then we'll We'll move on. Okay, so, so really quickly that um, they have the NVIDIA um, tools for training models, if you want to pre-train all the way from the base, you know, just a raw model on your own private data, um, but they're making it possible within um, uh, Cortex, I believe, to fine tune serverlessly, meaning like no muss, no fuss. If you take like Llama or Mistral and you want to fine tune it on your data, that's going to be drop dead simple. And then as we were talking about, NIMS are all the, all the models, the specialized models that NVIDIA has created, you can call out like a SQL function or a Python function, it's that drop dead simple, it's that integrated. And that is integrated as a container service. So it's in your security context, someone else you know, takes care of managing it, um, and it's all, it's all really simple. Yeah, and, and you may have seen uh, the Instruct Lab uh, announcement from Red Hat Summit, and it was sort of highlighted at IBM Think. And the, I don't know if you saw that, the whole focus of that was to simplify training. Yeah. Right, because, you know, you norm, or, or simplify fine tuning, sorry. Normally, when you, you, know, you train a model, it takes a long time, it's really expensive, and then you have to fine tune it. And the fine tuning is, was largely done by humans, right? And so, in, Instruct Lab was a way to simplify that. You maybe get a little, you know, human push off the dock, and then it sort of self trains. That, that is. Very advanced, actually, more so than what's Extremely here. Extremely advanced, and yeah. it's something that came out of IBM research. But my point is, you know, <laughs> that's why we love this industry. There's a lot of competition. Snowflake's not alone, and you're seeing others, um, you know, join in, which is just fantastic for, for customers. Okay, the other thing that we want to talk about is the, one of the you know buzziest things in the show was was the whole uh, discussion around uh, iceberg. If you bring up the next slide, that would be helpful. Um, the great iceberg debate, we called it. So the second that uh, Benoit Dejaville stood, uh, stepped on stage yesterday, Databricks dropped a press release saying they're buying Tabular, uh, which was founded by Ryan Blue, somebody we had on Breaking Analysis. He was the, one of the creators of Iceberg when he was at uh, Snowflake. So essentially, and we've been talking about open table formats you know, for quite some time, essentially Snowflake's saying, look, we're embracing open table formats. The, the, the customers are demanding it, and we're, we're responding. Um, go ahead, put your data into open table formats, and we're going to open source Polaris, which is the technical metadata catalog, and to make that available to the, to the community. And, oh, if you want it to be governed, that's when it starts to get interesting. Um, you can bring that into Snowflake and have you know, managed iceberg tables, um, or you can leave it externally, and, and, and you can read from those external tables, you can't update them. Um, but George, I, I felt like a couple of things here that I, I wanted to comment on. First of all, in my you know, many years of following technology markets, you know, the, world, the word open has been a kind of a moving target. You know, Unix used to be synonymous with open systems and, and this discussion is kind of no different. But the vision that we put forth on the six data platform is that any compute can, can access any data, and that's kind of where we think the market is headed via open data formats. And 
Snowflake has a, uh, I think, a, a, a convenient truth that it's really hard to get everybody to agree on these open formats and the, how, to, how to govern them. And so they can, they can sort of have their cake and eat it too for, for some period of time. And they've got options. They can extend you know, uh, Polaris to the community and the community can develop more governance capabilities or to the extent that customers want to pay up for that governed uh, capability, they can use um, Horizon inside of Snowflake. So add some color here. So um, what's interesting is that um, you're right to identify open as a loaded, overloaded term, yeah. because what, what Databricks was offering, they claimed you could, you could, with Databricks, read and write Delta Tables, which is their native ones, Iceberg and Hootie, which is it's a, from the tech community, that they said last year you could do all of them. It didn't work, it was, it was pre-announced, you know, as many things are. Um, but the source of truth, this is where we get to this six data platform. With the Snowflake world, when you read, read and write data, the source of truth is controlled by the DBMS because that's what's updating, you know, what's in this table, what's in that column, and has to update the met metadata around it. In the, in the world that Databricks was trying to define, you went through just Unity Catalog and, and the little Spark execution engine, but what that meant was Unity was a very big catalog. It was all the metadata about the lineage and permissions and feature store. In other words, they were, they were pushing their entire, the, the, the tip of the camel's nose of their product line into the ability to read and write those table formats. So what um, uh, Snowflake did was they said, we're going to create a iceberg catalog that's open source that can control that source of truth that severs the link to the whole Unity catalog. All you need is the technical metadata. So that was the cleverness behind And then you that. can choose which compute engine you right. want to apply and they're right. going to compete. What I like about Snowflake strategy, George, is they're, they're going to compete on the basis of their, their compute engine, which is very strong. Right. Very, it's, a, it's a smart move, you lead with your strength. You know, if you've got a good forehand in tennis, use it. Right. Run around your backhand if you have to, to win the game. Right. That's kind of what and, they're doing. And, and Databricks could not get um, that, that thing that they announced last year you know, Hootie, Delta, and Iceberg interoperability, where you transparently, you know, write to one, you get the others. They couldn't get it to work yet. So that's why they announced the uh, tabular acquisition. Okay, let's bring in some ETR data here, Tony, uh, the shared accounts peer position uh, slide. And we've selected some data ecosystem players here. This is not, this is by no means all of them, but we wanted to give you a sense. And what this shows is net score on the vertical axis, that's a measure of spending momentum. And in the horizontal uh, uh, axis is the presence, the overlap within 1,800 respondents in the April survey. And you can see here, we've plotted some of the cloud vendors. You see Azure and AWS, obviously up and to the right. By the way, anything over that 40% line is considered on the horizontal axis, or the vertical axis, is considered highly elevated. <clears throat> so you see the cloud folks, a Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud Platform. We've, we've added in some other products that ETR has in its uh, taxonomy, like Microsoft Dynamics. Um, we, we put in Power Automate, even though that's an RPA tool, but they have the power line. We don't have other power products inside the ETR database, but we just put it there just for context. You've got, you've got BI vendors, the visualization uh, of, of, with Tableau, now Salesforce. <clears throat> you've got ThoughtSpot, uh, you've got Looker, so you've got BI tools, and you have some governance that we put in there with like Alation and, and Calibra. <clears throat> and, and of course we got OpenAI and Anthropic, some of the LLM vendors, because they, they play a role here. And of course we show Databricks and Snowflake. And you can see the trajectory of those two companies over time. We've talked about this a lot on breaking analysis, where they're coming together from a, 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 a market momentum standpoint and a presence in the market. We also included Oracle on there. They're clearly a player here, but coming back to Databricks and Snowflake, they're, they're obviously in focus. We didn't put Salesforce on here. You know, I, I should have, George. Uh, Informatica is on there, Cloudera as well. And you've got many, many other, dozens and hundreds of companies in this ecosystem. George, anything you want to add uh, to this commentary? Yeah, just the point you were making by by emphasizing how many are there and how many have been left out. The point is, it's as if in the old world, compute were the infrastructure 
and everyone needed to get access to compute. Now data is the infrastructure, everyone needs to get access to the data. Many, many need to write the data, not just read it. And that's why we're moving to this world where data is an open resource and we're moving then, we're, we're up-leveling where the competition is to the engines that read and write that data. So that's why we're having to separate compute from data. Excellent, okay, let's wrap with the things that we're going to be watching here next week at Databricks Data Plus AI Summit. The Cube will be here. Uh, you'll be here, yes? Yes. Uh, John Furrier will be here, Rob Strecce. Uh, I will be at Reinforce, uh, the security show of, of uh, Amazon Web Services in Philadelphia. So I'll have a little FOMO, uh, but we'll be having a good show too. All right, some things that we're, we're thinking about for Databricks Data Plus AI Summit. It'll be a great show, big ecosystem at Moscone again. No doubt we're going to hear about the great iceberg debate will continue. Uh, they announced, Databricks announced the intent to acquire Tabular, um, and it was really going to be interesting to see how they position uh, Unity and Tabular. I presume, Coney, I forgot to cue this slide, I presume it's up there, sorry for that. Um, remember last year, right before the Data Plus AI Summit, uh, Databricks uh, bought Mosaic ML, Snowflake uh, bought uh, Sridhar's company, Neva. Um, <laughs> what, a, what a difference a year makes. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, Sridhar is now CEO, uh, you got the acquisition of, of, of Tabula. So how is Databricks going to leverage that Mosaic ML acquisition? What, what are they, how are they going to get, that was a really strategic acquisition for them, uh, and so we're going to most likely see some innovations there. And then, big discussion everywhere when you go to Red Hat, IBM, Dell, certainly Snowflake, how is Databricks going to position itself in enterprise AI to accelerate ROI and value and improve data quality for enterprise customers? That's you know, the big theme here, and, and it's all about trust and, 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 and the like. No longer, one of our guests today said, no longer can we move fast and break things. We're going to move fast without breaking things, so how is Databricks going to support that? And then number four here, what's next in Gen AI? Is Databricks going to unveil, what exciting new innovations are they going to unveil to take customers beyond what now become trivial RAG use cases, right? If your RAG was a hot thing, you know, six, seven, eight months ago, now it's like, oh yeah, that's kind of nice, but what else is there? How are you going to bring in maybe multiple models and leverage multiple models and, and, uh, and, and develop new capabilities? And then finally, the ecosystem, which is very, very strong, uh, both here at Snowflake Summit and we saw last year at Databricks, um, what role did the GSIs play? Uh, we're going to be looking for that. George, I'll give you the final word. What, what will you be looking for and your final thoughts on Snowflake Summit? Um, just a couple things. Having spoken to Naveen Rao, who was CEO of Mosaic um, and now heads Gen AI, um, they really believe that these data lakes or lake houses full of data can train, pre-train from scratch models like Rivian um, or people with time series data. In other words, they, they're going to help people build their own models and um, fine tune their own. Um, the, the RAG use cases, RAG everyone's to tossing around like, you know, oh, it's all solved. Um, it's very hard to get it right. They have, some, um, they have some technology that is a very new way of doing it. Um, we'll probably be hearing a lot about that. In the ecosystem, I will say one thing about, about their ambitions. Snowflake wants to be a cloud that's based on data. Databricks does not want to be a full application platform. Their aspiration is to build these analytic artifacts that plug into Salesforce, plug into Azure. They are not trying to muscle their way into a full platform. No, they're trying to be the horizontal artifacts, like you said, that horizontal technology that can be used anywhere, which is a very viable strategy where Snowflake's saying, we want to be the, the, the AI data cloud. We're going to build on that, so. All yeah. right, George, thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. All right, that's it for now. Hey, thank you team for hanging with us. Appreciate you guys staying late um, here at Moscone. Uh, remember, all these episodes from Breaking Analysis are available as podcasts. All you can do is just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. Uh, we publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. You want to get in touch, email me at, uh, at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at DeVellante or comment on our LinkedIn post. Please chime in, subscribe. Uh, really appreciate the, the commentary. And don't forget to check out etr.ai for the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for George Gilbert for theCUBE Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching everybody. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis and next week right here 
at Moscone. Thank you.